want to extend a warm welcome to the ninth annual Global Volatility Summit. We really hope that this event challenges your understanding of volatility, option trading, quantitative strategies and the like. And really our, our goal is that when you leave here today that you'll have a renewed, fresh look and understanding of volatility and the volatile days we live in today. Twenty seventeen was one of the most extraordinary events in the volatility space and we would classify it by far as a tail event. In 27 years, we've had 61 occurrences of when the VIX has been below 10 and 52 of them come in the past in 2017. That is an outsized probability event that we think are not gonna be repeatable again. This connection between volatility, the price of volatility, and how much it influences these other enormous pools of assets. The market has now seen the behavior of what happens if they push the market lower. I struggle to see how that isn't going to change the behavior of the volatility markets. And I struggle to see how we can possibly be back into a 2017 style environment. I think to me the, the rate market is the backbone of the, the risk premium market. So you had expensive VIX volatility, expensive VIX Q. On the other side you had kind of this elephant in the room where everyone knew that there was an accident but no one could point out to when it would happen. And to some extent the, the right side of that equation is gone and we're going to have to watch out if it does come back. I think it will be very difficult for it to come back in the same tune as it did before just because a lot of the instruments are now retired or have less leverage at the end of February. When the interest rates shudder starts to come, and we're still at 290s or 280s in the 10 year, this was the first one to shake out. But if we go towards more tightening, or possibly we do get some inflation, it's just the next steps down the road. And then the connections that Paul alluded to are so interesting. Still, the big elephant in the room are the tightening that's going to happen eventually, possibly inflation. In the end, it's all about the yield and the crash for yield. Even though we might continue to see higher volatility going forward, it certainly seems like this was more of a technical event in the U.S., given that uh, there are investors that had to cover their short volatility. And now that that's been taken out of the market, it seems reasonably unlikely that we would see that much stress in the uh, VIX complex again. Unless, of course, silly money comes back in and tries to uh, short volatility in that fashion. At the end of the day, I mean, we're talking about a new vol regime. It's not a new vol regime, it's the normal vol regime. I mean, what was weird was uh, 2017. And even, you know, even 2017, you could make the case that, yes, vol was low, but it wasn't particularly uh, cheap. In this last event, we had a carry focus. We had a a real focus on short volatility trading, whether it's XIV or elsewhere. You then had a catalyst, inflation, numbers, and then you had a clear exacerbator, all this selling from the XIV. If you go back to 1987, you had an environment, you had a kickoff on Friday, and then you had portfolio insurance. What I'm more interested in is the impact that sell-off had on S&P 500 volatility surface beyond the event. So six weeks after the event, uh, we are at a point where S&P volatility on its own uh, looks kind of cheap actually given everything that's on the horizon, uh, especially in the short data space. Having said that, uh, when you compare it with some of the other asset classes, some of the other equity underlyings, whether it's domestic or globally, it actually kind of screens a little expensive. Now, why is that? It's, it's primarily because so much of this sell-off that got catalyzed and exacerbated in that second week of the sell-off was because of the, the volatility-related products, primarily within the S&P 500 universe. If the S&P structurally starts to trade lower, you'd expect to see elements of economic weakness starting to filter through. You'd expect the Fed, instead of being in tightening mode, to maybe shift to neutral or to easing mode to provide some support for the market. In that environment, we'd expect the yield curve to steepen. 
you what's risperity? It's just portfolio construction of two negatively correlated assets, bonds that hedge you when you know when equities go down. And what you want to do is is exploit structural imbalances in the market. And the structural imbalances, it's, it's retail, Asian retail selling vol. They're selling so much vol that dealers can't warehouse all this risk, so they need to lay it off to the street. Current vol is a 20-year low, and, and in fact, effectively the all-time low. But if you just drill down to the last two years, vol is cut in half. So starting from what was already a really low level relative to the rest of the developed world, 50% further reduction. Why? A lot of it's driven by this yield curve control policies. I think there's a lot of value when you have these extremely low absolute vols, a lot of embedded convexity, and so we make the argument it's, it's worthy of focus right now at a point in the cycle where we may be seeing some policy change and worth careful attention. Just like the, the environment, how the, the volatility impacts our portfolio construction, we try not to have tactical uh, views. As we have this long-term view and diversified portfolio, we are willing to embrace more volatility into our portfolio, mainly because we have these RV strategies that tend to run uh, with low volatility. So in the macro space, we can add more volatility with macro and systematic. People increasingly talk about trend and CTA strategies as a form of crisis protection and as a diversifier in that sense. And we certainly believe in that, but in a very specific range of circumstances. And whilst January and February certainly showed that um, CTAs are not um, structurally long volatility all of the time, they do have certain long volatility characteristics. But it depends on obviously the market dynamics um, in terms of how they'll perform. So in particular, CTAs do tend to perform well through market crises that really bring about secular changes in regime. I think it's unfortunate that many of these strategies are, are indeed correlated, not so much negatively to volatility, but to uh, left tail skew. And I think that's something you simply have to, to budget for when you invest. Some of them are explicitly short volatility. Some of them explicitly attempt to harvest the VIG between implied and realized. Everyone in the room is looking for long volatility with a positive expected return. And that's not very easy to come by. So I think macro in general, sometimes it looks very long vol and sometimes it looks very short vol, right? But I think over time, um, because of the low correlation, it is often viewed as a long volatility strategy. Clearly not a perfectly long vol and it's not a perfect hedge, it's a diversifier. But again, we would all like to find a positive expected return from a long volatility exposure. I think the elephant in the room is more or less the bull market that we're in. The bull market is not noticed because volatility is low, People are still worried about a lot of things. We're in a, in a sort of reflation trade, especially also in Europe. Um, and I think that environment actually creates a lot of interesting topics that are very unrelated and offer the opportunity to reach out and take those trades instead of being only focused on timing the overall market. I like to think of panels as a little bit like markets and that they're both about timing. Three months ago, I don't think I could have gotten anyone's attention on a panel about hedging, unless, you know, maybe if I added the word blockchain to the title. You know, one of the most persistent uh, things out there is the extreme skew in term structure, primarily in the S&P, and identify ways to put together structures that take advantage of these massive flows from hedge equity products that generally go out and they buy a six month out of the money S&P put, and then they to hedge their equity exposure, and then they try and offset some of that exposure by selling upside calls or selling near-term volatility. It's like a pinata. Inside of that pinata are things like Vol Gamma, Vama, Zama, all of the higher end non-linear movement that you can get from market. And if you're very intelligent about structuring uh, how often you swing and, and how much energy you're utilizing, a large enough hit to that market can then uh, release all of these goodies. 
but it takes something very big to break the pinata. But if you're very tactical, you can structure your exposure in a way that minimizes your cost of carry and your theta and maximizes all those higher order exposures that you're looking at. One of the best tail we can find out there in the entire equity spectrum is actually uh, through dividends on Euro stocks. So over the last 20 years, the correlation between dividends on Euro stocks and equities is 80%. The traditional dividend trade is to buy longer dated dividend in Euro stocks 50 because the curve term structure is downward sloping. So you get a pull to par and a roll up as the time passes. Well, that's not true anymore. For the first time in 10 years, the dividend term structure is actually flat. So there is no roll up. It's a huge market and very few people invest in options. They use options for every other reason but investment. And in the vol space, there's massive opportunities either for diversification or for tail risk hedging. We happen to believe that long dated options out of the money provide you with the best convexity for the lowest carry. And when I look at the state of where we are now, we've had nine years of S&P that hasn't, we haven't seen a 30% down in the market for nine years. I think the real question is, from an investor standpoint is, does this mean that I need to be successful in monetizing at the right time for me to invest in tail? It's about long-term gains. And I see a tail hedging investment as a dynamic proposition that in effect, it has little to do with risk aversion. It's not necessarily about protecting your downside, which we all like, but it's about maximizing long-term returns. The president has broken the seal on trade protectionism. Uh, he first did so with the solar panel and washing machine tariffs, and then most recently with steel aluminum tariffs. The goal uh, is to discourage other countries from emulating and piggybacking on U.S. actions to put pressure on China for structural reforms. My takeaway is that I expect trade frictions uh, to intensify in the U.S.-China context in the year ahead, and companies with significant exposure to the Chinese market likely will feel the effects. Back in December, we said market will go up and volatility will go up as well. You know, and, and the reason why volatility will go up, we said, well, first, it's unsustainably low. Second, central banks are trying to normalize, uh, in US at least, um, and, and sort of there is an ongoing process of balance sheet roll off. Mm -hmm.